Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up my superhero comedy series, The Adventures of Powerhouse. It follows the adventures of Dave Johnson as we poke fun and pay homage to a whole lot of different superhero stuff. We've got several books released already. You can check out the first three books with the Powerhouse Heroic Adventures bundle. Uh, so check that out, and you can find all my books, audiobooks, and ebooks at store.greatdetectives.net. But now it's time to get into Philo Vance. And uh, there were actually several series that were based on the character. There were at least four series that I can find evidence of. And I believe that this one was actually the first. And it's a bit of an odd one. The Digital Deli Log doesn't have a very long uh, log for this series, so we have no idea when it started or ended, only that this episode came from that series. John Dunning doesn't even uh, reference the series in his Encyclopedia of Old Time Radio. Philo Vance was created in 1926 by S.S. Van Dyne and appeared in a series of novels that were really popular in the 1920s. The character still was around and continued to be popular, particularly through films, uh, including those of William Powell, in the 1930s. And we'll talk a little bit more about the history of Philo Vance after the episode. Uh, But let's go ahead and get into today's episode. The original air date, April 29th, 1943. And this one is The Case of the Cellini Cup. The makers of Raleigh Cigarette present John Emery, star of the Broadway success Angel Street, as Philo Vance in S.S. Van Dyne's murder mystery, The Case of the Cellini Cup. Good evening. I am Philo Vance, occupation criminologist. And tonight I'd like to tell you the adventure of the Cellini Cup. As I pieced this fantastic and incredible story together later, it started something like this. In the East 70s of New York City, deep in the gloomy shadow of the 3rd Avenue L, is a dingy little second-hand store called the Old World Curio Shop. It's about 10.30 at night. The front of the store is filled with the usual miscellaneous rubbish, but in the back there's a rather a good workshop. There's a light on there. The man is hunched over a workbench repairing the enamel on, of all things, a cloisonne elephant. This man is Paul Getman, about 43, rather heavy set, oily complexion, little pig eyes, smug and self-satisfied, but a clever workman. An unpleasant man, but then he hasn't long to live, although he doesn't know that. There's a discreet knock on the door at the front of the shop. Oh. He gets up and walks through the store to the door. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Well, hey, hey, put that gun down. Someone's liable to get hurt. (laughs) Wait a minute. Take it easy. What are you going to do? No, no, you don't dare. You can't get away with it. That's murder. For God's sake, don't do it. Well, why don't you say something? What are you waiting for? I know. I know what you're waiting for. You're waiting for the elevated train. You're waiting for the elevated train to drown out the shot. Will I get back? An 
now, here is Philo Vance to tell you the story of the Cellini Cup. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. Well, to explain how I got involved in this, John F.X. Markham, the district attorney, is an old friend of mine, and bright and early the morning after Getman was murdered, uh, much too bright and much too early, Markham came over to my apartment and dragged me over to the old world curio shop to view the mortal remains of Paul Getman. Sergeant Heath of the Homicide Squad met us at the door. A businesslike frown on his broad, pugnacious features and gestured toward the body. Well, here he is, shot through the heart. Doc Baker examined the body and pulled a thirty-two slug out of him. I would have bet my shirt it was a forty-five. Made a big hole going in. Hmm, so it did, Sergeant. Well, signs of a struggle. Who found the body, Sergeant? The patrolman on the beat. The burglar alarm went off and he came running. Looks like Getman set it off himself. There's a button right here on the counter, and we found Getman's thumbprint on it. Look at this, Markham. What's that, Vance? This utterly atrocious tie Getman was wearing. Imagine the embarrassment of being caught dead wearing a purple horror like this. I thought it was kind of snappy. Sergeant, you distress me. I've never seen you out of your uniform, but I'll wager you're a panic. Now, Vance, let's not get into a discussion of what the well-dressed corpse should wear. Calm yourself, Markham. Ah, what have we here? A little circular bit of charred cloth. Must be a clue, eh, Sergeant? I already seen it. I figured whoever came in here to bump Getman off hid the gun under something. Maybe a handkerchief. And when he fired, this piece of cloth was blown off. Figured that out myself. Not bad, huh? Sergeant, you've been going to night school. Suppose you tell us what you found out about the late Mr. Getman. Okay, he was in his early 40s. He owned this shop. He did repair work on fancy art objects for the museum and art dealers. And he was pretty good at it, I guess. He had a little apartment at the Windsor Arms, and that's about all. Hey, looks like a customer at the door. That's his second today. Markham, isn't that George Henry Howard? Yes, it is. The art collector? Yes, but there's more of the collector than the artist in him. Before the war, he traveled over Europe sweeping up statues, porcelains, tapestries, and so on like a vacuum cleaner. Between George Henry Howard and William Randolph first, the museums on the continent were left looking a trifle seedy. Let him in, Sergeant. Okay. Well, well. Mr. Vance, isn't it? How are you, Mr. Howard? Fine, fine. Never better, thanks. Mr. Markham, our district attorney and champion of justice. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Markham? And Sergeant Heath. How are you? How do you do? Is uh, Mr. Ketman here? Yes, but he's not speaking to anyone. He was murdered last night, Mr. Howard. Murdered? Really? Oh, definitely. Well, that's too bad. From my standpoint, as well as his, I wanted to buy a group of items in here. Uh, will his death interfere with selling them? Well, that would depend on whether there were any heirs and so on. Oh, yes, of course. Of course. Well, there seems to be a few pieces of some value in this case. Let's see, there's the triptych, the cloisonne vase, a copy of the Cellini cup, this beautiful German horizontal clock with hunting scenes in relief, circa 1600, I'd say. And quite right you are, Mr. Vance. Mm. Uh, by the way, Mr. Markham, I'd like to put a deposit of, uh, say, 4,000 on the contents of this case just to ensure my getting it. I'd top any bid by 250. Could I do that? Well, we'll have to take that up after the investigation is concluded. All right, fine, Mr. Markham. Thank you very much. If I can be of any help... Thank you. Quite all right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Vance. Goodbye, Mr. Vance. Goodbye. Four thousand bucks for that stuff? I could do better at the five and dime. Yeah, worth about two thousand. Oh, Sergeant, you mentioned another customer. Oh, yeah, before you got here. A man by the name of Hans Hendricks. An art dealer, he told me. Oh, yes. The Hans Hendricks Gallery is on 57th Street. Anyway, he came to pick up an art object Getman was repairing for him. He had a receipt for it, so I let him in to make sure it was here. But I didn't let him take it. Oh, I'll answer it. Maybe my office. Well, um, what do you think of this, Sergeant? Oh, I got a theory. When there ain't no clues, I always say what the French say. Church a femme. Church a femme. Uh, church a femme, eh? Yeah, in French, it means look for the dame. Oh, thank you for the translation, Sergeant. That's okay. That was the office, Vance. Wacker tells me they got the license number of a car that was seen here last night. Well, now we've got something concrete to work on. I have nothing very exciting to do this afternoon. Suppose I take this gentleman and scholar, the incredible Sergeant Heath, and the two of us will trace that license number to its lair. <laughs> It 
It's like I tell you, Mr. Vance. You don't have to be no genius to solve murders. All you do is ask the right people the right questions. Providing one can find the right people. Well, we sure got a lot of information so far. The owner of the car rented it to a guy named Tony Carpini who lives in Queens. Yes, and this Carpini had a date last night with a girl named Norma Allen who lives in Flushing. Church FM, huh? She'll be in Mr. Markham's office tomorrow morning. I'll pick up Carpini and we'll... Well, we'll ask questions and solve the murder. You make it sound delightfully simple. Yeah, it's a cinch. I guess I know how to figure these things out instinctively. Sergeant, you've been most instructive. Oh, that's okay. Well, now, let's get on to the Hans Hendricks galleries. I'd like a few words with Mr. Hendricks. Please sit down, Mr. Vance and Sergeant Heath. Thanks. Now then... I'm at your service. Well, Mr. Hendricks, I'm looking for one of your messengers in connection with the Getman murder. A guy called Tony Carpini. Ah, so. Unfortunately, he is no longer in my employ. You mean you fired him? Yes, this morning. So you are looking for Tony, eh? I'm glad they got rid of him. If I'm not too inquisitive, Mr. Hendricks, why did you dismiss him? I did not trust the man. And, of course, you had excellent reasons for not trusting him? He had quite a temper. Just lately, he was very surly. Not a man to trust with a gun. A gun? Did he carry a gun? My messengers often deliver valuable pieces. I believe I saw in the papers that the bullet was a thirty-two. Yeah, that's right. You may be interested to know that Tony's gun was a thirty-two. I, I, I have it here in my desk. Well, well, right in your desk. Now, that's convenient, Mr. Hendricks. He turned it in when I discharged him. Yeah. There you are, Sergeant. Thanks. I'll just take this along. Where did Tony keep the gun? After work, I mean. In his locker with his uniform. I presume he had a key to the delivery entrance? And he could get in at night if he wanted to? <laughs> Easily. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Mr. Hendricks. Oh, uh, say, before I go, my wife wants an extra chair for the living room, and I noticed that one by the door as we came in. And the sergeant sat in it, bounced in it, slumped in it, and finally decided he and the chair were soulmates. <laughs> it's that carved chair with a needlepoint upholstery. Of course, of course, I know the chair. How much are you asking for it? It is priced at $575, I believe. Holy cow, I can get the same thing at Ludwig Bauman's for thirty-one seventy-five. Well, thanks again. Not at all. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. All right. Now we're really getting somewhere. And without none of that fancy uh, psychology of yours either, Mr. Vance. That guy Hendricks was pretty helpful. Wasn't he, though? Almost too helpful. What's the news this morning, Markham? You look like the cat that swallowed the canary and went proudly around hiccuping feathers. Well, Vance, Sergeant Heath's out tracking down our man now. I told him to bring him in as soon as he located him. And who is the man? <laughs> Never thought I'd hear Philo Vance ask that question. You usually know who the man is. So nice of you to say so, old fellow. You know, Vance, a gun scratches its individual signature on bullets that leave the barrel. So we compared the bullet that killed Getman with a bullet fired from the gun that that messenger, uh, Tony... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Tony Carpini. The bullets match perfectly. Looks like he did it. My dear Markham, it only proves that a bullet fired from his gun brought about Getman's untimely demise. Vance, you're splitting hairs. Splitting hairs is a hobby of mine, Markham, old boy. A hobby that I thought I shared with all members of the legal profession. Yes, Mr. Markham. Uh, send Miss Allen in. Yes, sir. Ah, that would be our femme fatale, the Cleopatra of Flushing. <laughs> From Swacker's voice, I'd say she left him goggle-eyed. Ah. Oh, uh, come in and sit down, Miss Allen. Yes, yeah, thanks. I'm Mr. Markham, and this is Mr. Vance, a sort of special assistant of mine. A pleasure, Miss Allen. Oh, uh, likewise. We'd like to have you tell us what happened the night of the murder. Well, I had a date with Tony, and we drove around a little, and then we parked, and... He started talking about me going out with Mr. Getman. He got sore, and I told him that we would have to consider our acquaintanceship at an end because I had become engaged to Mr. Getman. You have only been engaged eight days. I didn't even get a ring. And what was Tony's reaction to the news of your engagement? He was wild. He was mad. 
He, he threatened to kill me and Paul. Uh, that's Mr. Getman. So I asked him to be so kind as to take me home. Yes, sir. Uh, what time was it he brought you home? Uh, about quarter to eight. Oh, he did it all right, Mr. Markham. Oh, thank you very much, Miss Allen. And now... Uh, just a moment, Markham. Miss Allen, how long have you been, uh, dating Mr. Getman? Oh, about four months, I guess. I met him when Tony had to deliver something to his shop to be repaired after hours, and he took me along. Paul fell in love with me at first sight. I'm considered very attractive by men. Well, obviously. And you liked Mr. Getman very much, I presume. Oh, indeed. Indeed, yes. I, I've always wished to travel, and he was going to take me to South America after the duration of the duration. Paul knew lots of important people, too, if you know what I mean. I'm afraid I don't. Well, like Mr. Howard, the art collector. Paul took me to one of Mr. Howard's cocktail parties. Gee, it was swell. Nobody was there who wasn't somebody. Vance, don't you Just be patient a moment, Markham. I even talked with Mr. Howard himself in person. Oh, he was swell. And he showed me some of his collection. You know, etchings and things. When I told him Tony worked for Mr. Hendricks, and I knew all about art from what Tony had told me. I what... see. And uh, you and Mr. Howard got along very well together? Oh, Sure. I told him all about Tony and I and Paul, and he laughed and laughed. I was a big hit at that party. Gee, I guess I'll never get to travel after what Tony done. Oh, I imagine another man will come along and be blinded by your charms, Miss Allen. Yeah, I suppose so, but maybe he won't be no gentleman like Mr. Getton. Hey, will you stop oh, showing me around? Tony. Oh, Here's Carpini, this? Mr. Markham. He was out on the town last night, but I grabbed him when he came back to his room. Had his bags packed and was all ready to skip town. Tony, what did you do it for? What did you do it for? You spoiled everything. I didn't kill him. You did, too. You said you were going to. Ah, uh, shut up, will you? I hate you. I'll never give you another day. Will you shut up? I tell you, I didn't kill him. I didn't have nothing to do with it. You did, too. You're a murderer. That's what you are, a murderer. <laughs> Oh, he hit me. Cut it out, Carpini. <laughs> ah, let go of me. It's her own fault. She started it. Take him away, Sergeant. Okay, Mr. Markham. I guess he's a man, all right. What'd I tell you, Mr. Vance? <laughs> Church A. Femme. Church A. Femme. Come on, Carpini. Oh, nuts. <laughs> Here, use my handkerchief, Miss Allen. Oh, gee, thanks. You're awfully nice to me. Ah, uh, not I, Miss Allen. Some other gentleman. Well, Vance, are you convinced now? Not entirely, Markham. So I think I'll trot along and see if I can comb a little information from George Henry Howard. Are you going now? Yes, Miss Allen. But before I depart, I think you may be interested to know that Mr. Markham is a bachelor and a very eligible gentleman. Hmm? Confidentially, he's fascinated by you. No kidding. <laughs> Why, Mr. Markham. Vance, what's the idea? Bye bye, Markham. Oh, sit down, sit down, Mr. Vance. Thank you, Mr. Howard. A very pleasant den you have here. <laughs> yes, I like it. I see the cases along the walls are filled with the ripe fruit of your continental travels. Some beautiful things. You like them, eh? Well, when I saw something I wanted, I got it. Of course, these cases represent only a fraction of my entire collection. Now, uh, <clears throat> these two curved swords are nice. Creases, they're called. I picked them up in the Malay States ten years ago. Sharp as razors. And an exquisite pair of old dueling pistols. I, I suppose they are dueling pistols, aren't they? Oh, yes, yes. I got them in France. Beautiful inlaid gold work on them. And you'll notice they're identical in weight, shape, trigger pull, everything. Had to be, you know, to make the duel fair. Amazing. And I suppose these little cloth patches are for cleaning the guns. That's right. That's quite right. Well, what have we here in this case? It looks like a copy of that Cellini cup in the Metropolitan Museum. Yes, it's a good copy, too. Yes, it is. You have a whole case of ivory figurines, I see. Mm -hmm. I collected them for a while. Only a few of them have any real value. By the by, Mr. Howard, I came to ask about Hans Hendricks. You've had dealings with him, I suppose. Oh, yes. You see, Getman's murder is pretty well pinned on one of Hendricks' messengers. It was his gun. Please don't repeat this, but it occurred to me that Hendricks also might have access to that gun. Oh, I see, I see. Do you know... Do you happen to know whether Hendricks and Getman got along all right together? Well, as far as I know. Of course, Hans is a shrewd Dutchman, <laughs> He's an art dealer, too. Yeah, I gather your opinion of the integrity of art dealers is not too frightfully high. <laughs> you never can tell, Mr. Vance. You never can tell. Mm. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Howard. You've been most helpful. Well, Tony, nice cell you have here. Don't be funny. Tony, I'd like to ask you a question or so. Yeah? You trying to help me? Yes. What's your angle? Well, Tony, I'm of the opinion that jail is an unhealthy place to be. If you answer a few questions, I may be able to help get you out. Okay. What have I got to lose? Did Mr. Hendricks know about your trouble with Miss Allen and Getman? If he did, I didn't tell him. He might have found out from Getman, though. That's right, too. Did Mr. Hendricks ever give you anything to deliver to Mr. Howard? Yeah, a couple of times. And that Mr. Howard is a right guy. And how did you come to that conclusion? Well, you see, I delivered a vase about a week ago, and there was a party going on. Mr. Howard was pretty tight, and he spilled two drinks he was holding all over me. Oh, Mr. Vance... Oh, just a moment, Sergeant. Go ahead, Tony. Well, he took my clothes and gave me one of his silk bathrobes to wear and had my clothes dried while I sat in the room. Then he gave me ten bucks. I thought that was okay. Hmm. Now, Sergeant? I found out if Mr. Markham was in his office like he asked me to. He is all right. Thanks very much, Sergeant. You're a noble custodian of the law. I'll be right... Go right up and see him. Well, thank you, Tony. Don't worry too much. Vance, for heaven's sakes, what did you bring me here to the museum for? Stop fretting, Markham. I wanted to lift you out of the hurly-burly of your mundane world, far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, and to transport you to the cool halls of this temple of art. Now, what sort of nonsense is that? Once in a while, you've got to get away from jangling telephones, noisy courtrooms, and intellectuals such as the good Sergeant Heath. You've got to get away and enter this world of beauty and quiet and romance. Look at the Etruscan shield in this case, Markham. Yeah, very nice. What stories it could tell. How many heroes buckled it on and strode bravely into battle shouting some barbaric cry? Yet, here it is today, still full of beauty. Ah, here's the Cellini cup. Remember, there was a copy of it in that case in Getman's shop. Benvenuto Cellini. Artist, writer, swordsman, adventurer, the gay lover of the Renaissance. And over here... Now, Vance, you're not going to take me on a conducted tour of the Metropolitan Museum, are you? I've got work to do. All right, Markham. I have a few things to do myself. But if you and Sergeant Heath will arrange under some pretext for Howard and Hendricks to be at the Old World Curio Shop two hours from now, I'll turn over the murder of Paul Getman to you at the conclusion of a short lecture. And now here's Philo Vance. Well, Howard and Hendricks put in their appearance at the Old World Curio Shop on the dot of eight with Markham and Sergeant Heath. Howard was his usual jovial self, but Hendricks was quiet. And it seemed to me a little suspicious. I had chairs arranged around a table and seated Howard and Hendricks with their backs to the showcases. Markham tossed the conversational ball right into my lap. Uh, Mr. Vance will explain this meeting to you, gentlemen. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, you both have something you want to get out of this shop, and knowing how complicated the legal machinery that Mr. Markham so valiantly protects is, I persuaded him to settle the whole thing tonight and save both of you the inconvenience of waiting for Getman's fares to be settled. Mr. Hendricks, I believe there's something of yours here in the shop that Getman was repairing for you. A large cloisonne elephant. And, Mr. Howard, you wanted to buy the contents of one of these showcases, didn't you? That's right, Mr. Vance. Getman and I had already agreed on a price of 4000 Which seems more than fair to me. It's amazing, isn't it, how a small piece of lead can complicate the lives of a lot of people? Tony Carpini didn't simplify matters for either of you. Then he's the one who did it, huh? That's right, Mr. Howard. Church FM. I didn't know I had a man like that working for me. Funny, I always thought he was a nice boy. Well, I don't agree with Sergeant Heath's Church FM theory, as he calls it. I think the motive was robbery. There was one item in this case that Tony might have thought represented a fortune in itself. Just a minute. It was this item right here. Look, a copy of the Cellini Cup. This is what lured a man to the depths of murder. 
But it never will again because I'm going to smash it to pieces on this table. Don't do that. Don't, you fool. Stop. That's the real cup. That's the original. Stop it, you idiot. You're smashing one of the greatest treasures in the world. Sergeant Heath, you may arrest Mr. Howard for the murder of Paul Getman. Well, Markham, the Admirable Curry has just informed me that he will serve dinner in three minutes. Nance, you irritating so-and-so. Sit down and tell me how you knew Howard murdered Getman. His confession clears Tony, but there's still a lot of things unanswered. Well, there's no point in my being coy with you, Markham. Where shall I begin? Why did Howard kill Getman? His confession explains that, but suppose I put it in order. A. Howard was a wealthy art collector who wanted something he couldn't buy. The Cellini cup that was in the museum. B. Getman was a clever goldsmith who did repair work for the museum. He had access to the Cellini cup. C. Howard bribed Getman to make a copy of the cup and substitute it for the original. But D. Getman made two copies, substituted one for the original which he kept, and sent the other copy to Howard, who E. for exterminate, decided to kill him when he found he had been double-crossed and did. Yes, yes, Vance, I know all that, and it isn't necessary to talk to me as though I were a child. Yeah, I'm not at all sure about that, Markham. Oh, go on, go on. What about the bullet from Tony Carpini's gun matching the one that killed Getman? Stop giving me the story in driblets. Well, at that party Miss Allen went to, she mentioned to Howard that Tony had threatened to kill Getman, and Howard realized he had a perfect fall guy, shall we say. He ordered some items sent from Hendricks, and then Tony delivered it. Howard spilled the drinks on him. With a pretext of drying his clothes, Howard got a hold of the gun, took it to the basement, fired several shots into something that wouldn't destroy the markings on the bullets, then cleaned the gun and replaced the empty shells. Yes, but how did he shoot Getman with that bullet? Oh, very simple. Howard owned a pair of muzzle-loading dueling pistols, and he loaded one of them with a bullet from the gun. Remember that charred piece of cloth that was near the body? Yes. That was used to tamp the powder down. And remember Sergeant Heath remarked about the hole the bullet made, that it was large, and he'd guessed the bullet was a forty-five. Well, the thirty-two bullet was a little small for the gun, and it wasn't going straight when it hit Getman. Yeah, Howard was an ingenious devil, wasn't he? Come, come, Markham, don't give him all the applause. Save a little for me. All right, you too are an ingenious devil. But what made you suspect Howard? A number of things. First, my suspicions were aroused when he offered twice as much for the contents of that case containing the Cellini cup as they were worth. Then it seemed strange that a man of Howard's position would invite Getman and his lady love to one of his parties. Of course, though, they were partners in crime. Yes, that seemed odd to me, too. It bothered me, and I dropped in to chat with Howard about it. Saw the dueling pistols and the little cloth patches. And also discovered to my surprise that he already had a copy of the Cellini cup. Why should he want another? So you took another look at the one in Getman's shop, found it was the original, and dragged me over to the museum where you saw a copy in place of the original. <laughs> Excellent. An astounding piece of deduction, Markham. I exchanged the cups with the full cooperation of two days, the directors of the museum, and pulled the psychological rabbit out of my hat. But why did you have me bring Hendricks over here to the shop, too? Well, there was a possibility that Getman might have gone to Hendricks with the cup, hoping to sell it to him and get some money in addition to what Howard had already given him. Who knows? Perhaps he did. And Hendricks had access to Tony's gun. But I was sure that a man who was willing to risk his life and reputation for that cup couldn't sit quietly and see it smashed in front of his eyes. Lance, you're an amazing person. I'm also hungry. Come, Markham. I see curry signaling that dinner is served. I hope the chicken tetrazzini is good. Catching a murderer has given me quite an appetite. Next week, at the same time, the makers of Raleigh Cigarettes will again present Paolo Vance to tell you and your friends another exciting story. A story he calls The Mystery of the Singing Cat. The part of Paolo Vance was played by John Emery. Tom Shirley speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 
Welcome back. It's really unusual to find a series like this uh, where the only surviving episode is actually a network uh, program uh, from NBC as opposed to something from the Armed Forces uh, Radio Service. I guess I should talk a little bit about Philo Vance as a character and his origins. He was created back in 1926 in the Benson murder case. And he was very much a character of the time. In one way, it's kind of reminiscent of The Great Gatsby that came out uh, the year before. There's a great division among a lot of people about The Great Gatsby these days, with many praising the story and the writing of F. Scott Fitzgerald, but many others finding the characters and situations just insufferable and having so many issues with it. And in many ways, it's the exact same thing as Vance. However, follow Vance stories don't have near the literary merit of The Great Gatsby. Vance was created as a very flippant, disdainful person who was smarter and better than everyone else and knew it, and had no problem letting anyone else know it as well. And I don't know, I think maybe in the middle 20s, the way that he was written in the first book might be the only time that you could find a mass appreciative audience in America for that sort of character. I read through the Benson murder case, and honestly, if I wasn't going to do Philo Vance on the podcast and write a review of it, I don't know if I would have made it past the first third of the book. Uh, the writer, S.S. Van Dyne, writes on and on at length about how amazing Philo Vance is. Van Dyne actually writes himself in as a character who uh, lives with and works for Vance and showers uh, praise on him constantly in the book. Even while Vance continues to be insufferable, talking highly accented and highly specialized sorts of slang that you practically need a dictionary to follow sometimes when he's talking, while being rude and snotty to nearly everyone. And Vance did earn himself some uh, contemporary critics. Ogden Nash, the American poet, wrote, Philo Vance needs a kick in the ponce. Edmund Pearson, a golden age uh, true crime writer, uh, wrote of Vance, Vance is the most insufferable person whom I have met in the pages of a novel. Any man who met him in a club would instantly get up and seek refuge in another room. He is a dilettante, a flaneur, a poser, a viveur, and if you can think of any other foreign terms, he is all of them to boot. He talks like a high school girl during her f first year in studying French. Surely the author could have suggested this type of man without overloading his conversation with foreign phrases and perpetual airy references to various learned matters. Despite that, uh, he was popular in the 20s and I think in the 30s. Uh, and part of the appeal, you know, when I think about it, is that the golden age of crime fiction was, for the most part, defined by uh, British writers, you know, Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and G.K. Chesterton. For sophisticated Americans to have uh, an entry into that world, I, I think was somewhat appealing. Now, having shared some of the criticism of the Vance character, let me go ahead and say that I did read another uh, Vance book, The Kennel Murder Case, because we're going to be doing that for public domain video theater, and I wanted to be aware of what the movie was so I could talk about that. And I actually enjoyed the Kennel uh, murder case, and mostly enjoyed Philo Vance in that. So apparently as time went on, Van Dyne did tone it down a bit, but I think those first novels just made such a huge impression and not in a good way. The character did remain popular with the public despite this. I think 
for uh, reasons outside of the books. Uh, Van Dyne was very keen to turn Philo Vance into uh, movies. William Powell starred in the most Philo Vance movies, but there were uh, several others that took multiple turns. And the way that Van Dyne actually sold the books as movies was different. Uh, other creators would sell you know, say, you know, you can buy a bunch of Michael Shane books, you know, and you'll make all of the Michael Shane movies for a while. But he actually sold uh, adaptations to individual studios. Like he just, Basil Rathbone, starring in a Philo Vance film, at the same time that uh, William Powell had made four films because he just sold the rights to that particular story to a different studio. So in many ways, the Philo Vance film helped the Philo Vance brand. And there were even uh, films made into the 1940s that had nothing to do uh, with the original books. Uh, I think the thought was that with so many detective stories being written and created, if you can come up with a property that's got some name recognition, even if you don't want to write the traditional story associated with that character, you can make more money than someone who uh, creates a character on their own. The radio version that we heard of Vance wasn't entirely like that, but it was definitely updated from the original. The original file of Vance didn't have an occupation. He was just a rich guy who had a lot of money, bought expensive things, did what he wanted, and, you know, went out and solved some crimes because he felt like it. Here, Philo Vance is given a occupation of criminologist. No idea how he makes money from it, but it's his occupation. I did like the idea of John Gibson, who plays Ethelbert on Casey Crime Photographer, being cast as Sergeant Heat. I th think that was pretty perfect casting in that regards, based on the books and the movies that I've seen. Although Sergeant Heath isn't in uniform, and that's a weird way to write it, because he was a uh, detective, the rank of sergeant, rather than a uniform sergeant. So, and that's how he functions on the radio, so it's odd for them to describe him as being in uniform. The case itself, I think, was fine. John Emery, he was not bad, but there's not a whole lot, uh, I guess, to do with this particular script. It was kind of a perfectly okay uh, mystery. It left me at a position where if I found out that there were more episodes, I would certainly listen to them, but this is not like in my top 50 programs that I'd like to hear, you know, lost episodes of. But it's still intriguing for what it is and for when it came from. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, now I want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Chad, Patreon supporter since September 2017, currently supporting the show at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Chad. And that will do it for today. A reminder, if you are listening to this podcast over on YouTube, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. Coming up this Saturday, listen for the premiere of Tales of the Texas Rangers. And then uh, next Tuesday, we'll be getting into previously uncirculated episodes of Jeff Regan. And then next Thursday, we'll be taking a listen to a different iteration of Philo Vance. And tomorrow, of course, we'll be bringing you the man with the action-packed expense account, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where... And I hope you'll be listening. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become... One of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. And don't forget our, about our Instagram, instagram.com slash great detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.